I'm just going to have a, a few uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, our speakers um, have about 40 minutes. Uh, questions will be uh, entered into the chat. And the moderator at the end of the session um, will be able to uh, pose the questions to the speaker. Uh, but uh, we shouldn't be raising our hands uh, to talk directly to the speaker. We have too many people online and it will just be a chaos. That's number one. Um, number two, I just want to reach out and say thanks to uh, all of you for joining, but I especially want to say thanks to Beatrice for organizing this. I mean, she's been an incredible uh, force of nature, if you will, in putting together these symposia down the years. With that, I'm going to uh, turn over the, uh, the screen to uh, Jeremy England. Uh, Jeremy uh, received his bachelor's degree in um, biochemistry from uh, Harvard. And then he received his PhD in physics from Stanford. From 2011 to 2019, he was an associate professor in the Department of Physics at MIT, which is when I first bumped into him when he was invited to Rutgers by uh, Joel Lebowitz to give a talk on non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Um, and he has led a research group in studying non-equilibrium statistical mechanics uh, for many years. And he's written an extraordinarily interesting book, which is very accessible. Um, and I, uh, I'll just turn this over now to uh, Jeremy. Jeremy, you're on. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for the invitation to speak and for that introduction. And, and thanks also to Dror. Um, I, I, I remember my interactions with Danny Well, both his personal warmth and what an inspiration he was to me uh, early in my scientific career when I would visit the Weizmann. Um, and it certainly is a, a great loss for all of us. So I was encouraged to try to be a bit pedagogical at the beginning of this talk and, and try to ease into thinking about what is different uh, in the non-equilibrium setting than in the equilibrium setting and why might that be important to how we think about the physics of life or at least the physics of life-like behavior, uh, which I try to stress uh, is an important stepping stone in, in that discussion, especially because we have to take living things and kind of break them into different distinct physical phenomena that are each perhaps not unique to life, but certainly all together in a bundle remind us of life. Things like self-replication, things like energy harvesting, things like prediction of one's surroundings. Each one of those behaviors in its own right is interesting to study, and it's easier to define what it means to study it in terms of physics and chemistry if you kind of break it off from the living whole. And then as soon as you do that, you're not dealing with the living thing anymore. So if you want to roll things back to the beginning and think about things on the other side of that boundary, but sort of just on the cusp, uh, then I think it's helpful to, to split things into different uh, distinct phenomena. And, and there, uh, I think what one often finds is that every distinctively lifelike phenomenon, or perhaps it's not everyone, certainly many of them, uh, is something that is almost forbidden away from, uh, forbidden in thermal equilibrium and requires you to be far from thermal equilibrium. That may not be generally the case, but it's certainly frequently the case. So just starting with a, a, a brief primer and where we get ideas of statistical equilibrium. The idea is just you have a bunch of particles, they have some energy that they share, they obey Newton's laws or something fancier that basically is equivalent for the purpose of this argument. And they wander around in some space of possibility according to some equations of motion. Uh, and the thing that we generally assume in order to get to statistical mechanics is that they wander around somewhat chaotically so that they're gonna eventually kind of randomly explore the space of arrangements that are available to them at some energy. So that's called the microcanonical picture. It's the beginning of, of statistical mechanics at a theoretical level. And then we introduce the idea of what's called coarse graining, because that's really how we're going to relate to living things. It's how we're going to relate to macroscopic things. We measure things that really look the same at the macroscopic level, despite many possible microscopic arrangements that could give you that same result. And generally, when you pick something macroscopic that you're interested in, you find, and I'm really kind of borrowing this diagram conceptually from a book I read by Roger Penrose when I was much, much younger that uh, illustrated this very well, uh, but just that you have this whole space you're exploring. And when you pick something to measure and you coarse grain, you're gonna have very tiny regions that correspond to some values of what you wanna measure and very big regions that correspond to other ones. And it just happens that way because for example, what if you're measuring the number of air molecules in the corner of the room? Well, 
most ways of arranging the air in the room don't put that many molecules in the corner of the room. But of course, some of the ways put all the molecules in the corner of the room. Um, and so now you're going to have different amounts or different numbers of ways of arranging the system uh, that will give you the same uh, observable result as far as what you're focusing on measuring. Uh, and you're going to explore around and maybe you're going to spend more of your time in those bigger volumes because they're not just as big uh, as the ones I've drawn here. They're obviously astronomically bigger than some of the small volumes. So that picture of a closed system is what gets you the thermal equilibrium picture. The, the idea of an open system that's surrounded by some bath that gives you thermal fluctuations at some temperature. So you have all these pieces, maybe they're atoms and molecules, maybe they're bigger things. They can fit together into different arrangements and the relative probabilities of different arrangements are gonna be controlled uh, by the differences in energy between them and the temperature that you're at. So it all just has to do with how energy is getting shared around and this thing that's randomly exploring its possible arrangements. Higher energy is kind of like collecting a whole bunch of particles in the corner of the room. It's, it's collecting a lot of energy into your system from the heat bath around it. And so it's less likely. Uh, and, and that's called the Boltzmann distribution. And that's how we reason about what happens probabilistically in what's called thermal equilibrium, which is really an example of statistical equilibrium uh, motivated from uh, that initial picture of, of just wandering around. So now I have this thought experiment I, I like to introduce sometimes. It's sort of the uh, thermodynamicist version of Schrodinger's cat, um, or, or let's say uh, biological thermodynamicist. So uh, instead of endangering a cat, we'll endanger a dog. And this is much simpler conceptually. Take a dog, put it in a box, and wait a trillion years, and then see if the dog is alive afterwards. Uh, and, and we all know the answer to the question. Uh, and, and the reason for that, essentially, in terms of what I just described, is that it has to do with statistical equilibrium, right? That there are lots of different ways of being what you'd call dead as arrangements of the constituent parts of a living thing. And there really are only a very tiny number of arrangements by comparison of those same building blocks that you would want to call alive. Now, actually affecting such a coarse graining in any rigorous way, you know, we're not gonna be able to do. But conceptually, I think it helps us just to remind ourselves that if we're talking about a closed system, exploring at constant energy, we don't get life because really there's something exceptional and rare about the ways that building blocks get put together that we call them lifelike in comparison to their many random arrangements uh, of the same constituent parts. But then in order to really think about this uh, with any way of making progress, we have to immediately switch to what we call an open system picture where we focus on the matter that's getting rearranged and we don't worry about the bath around us and all the energy that's in the universe because that's too much to keep track of. And so the typical non-equilibrium picture we're thinking about is that it's an open system where there's some working material in the middle and there's thermal fluctuations coming from a reservoir in the surroundings. The, that letter beta is just the inverse of temperature. So it's fancy physicist way of saying temperature. Um, and then you have an external drive, some forcing that's kicking the system around and keeping energy flowing in so that work goes in and then heat can come out into the bath. So that's the picture in which this working material in the middle can be alive and can stay alive and be maintained in that state, even though that state is an extremely rare subset of arrangements of the constituent pieces of the system. So now one other idea we need to introduce, again, starting very much from fundamentals is essentially Newton's third law. So we, we call this again to be fancy time reversal symmetry, but really this is just for each action has, a, has an equal and opposite reaction. The idea is, uh, that according to the equations of motion that we think physical matter obeys, there always are going to be pairs of trajectories the matter could take that look like rewind movies of each other. Uh, and they're both equally possible. So if you can go one way, you can go the other way. Getting back to endangering cats instead of dogs, you could drop a cat from a height, or you could drop kick a cat up in the air, and both of those are allowed, right? So they're equally permissible dynamical trajectories according to Newton's laws, so long as you impart to the system the right initial conditions, you can see one thing happen or you can see the rewind movie happen. But really this doesn't work exactly with cats so easily, right? It works with particles because then, or billiard balls, it's easier to relate to as an idea. Uh, and even when we start thinking about it in terms of what it means for chemistry, it already starts getting complicated when things get a little more complex. So if I think of this uh, in, in chemical terms, I have the idea of chemical equilibrium which I can either think of as being about ratios of quantities that are stably at certain concentrations, or I can think of it as a dynamical property where I have these rates of reactions that are carrying me from one state to another. Uh, and 
as a result of all the different interconversions, there's a dynamic of equilibrium that emerges where the equilibrium constants that are really related to thermodynamic quantities like free energy are going to arise from the rate constants that are governing the timings of all the different transitions from one molecular state to another. So what are the implications of what I just said? This, you know, cats can fall down or go up for chemistry, right? If I, if I say I have time reversal symmetry in the physics, then when the chemistry arises from the physics, what does that get me? Well, one thing it gets you, and maybe the famous thing that it gets you, um, is that you're not allowed in chemical equilibrium to have detailed balance breaking. What's detailed balance breaking? The idea is that if you have different chemical states, it might be, for example, in a triad of them, that there's more than one way of going around. You could go from A to B to C and back to A, or you could go from A to C to B and back to A. And if you had a situation somehow where there was much more current of chemical flux going around one way in this circle than the other, that actually wouldn't be allowed according essentially to Newton's third law, to time reversal symmetry. Uh, and so in chemical equilibrium, you, you don't get this. Um, uh, and instead you get what's called detailed balance where every pair of reactions has balanced chemical flux along each edge. Of course, when we now think, think about living things, it's obvious that living things are very much in violation of this rule that governs equilibrium, right? We commonly see plants grow uh, and we never see plants ungrow back into seeds. Uh, and it's not just because they're moving so slowly and we don't bother to watch for too long. It's clearly just flagrantly impossible. Uh, and, and the reason, if you think about it a little bit, is just because we're watching the plant, but really there's all this light going in and heat going out, and there's one kind of chemical gas going in and another kind of chemical gas going out. Uh, and, and so it's really an open system that's being maintained away from thermal and chemical equilibrium. And so there we're permitted to really strongly break this time reversal symmetry rule in the observed dynamics. Uh, and so that now raises the question, well, so what can we say instead of the Boltzmann and thermal equilibrium picture, what can we say about what happens when I have some external drive and I'm poking and kicking the system with some kind of pattern form of energy? And now I want to know what's the probability of being in one state over another state? Why would one assembly state end up being more likely than another? And it's no longer as simple as just looking at the endpoint and saying which one is higher or lower in energy. Now the path and the history of the system becomes extremely important. Uh, and just to clarify what I mean by driving here, there are different ways of being pushed away from equilibrium. We don't have to talk about all of them now, but you can have time bearing external fields and forces like light or uh, other kinds of electromagnetic influences. You can have auditory or acoustic or mechanical influences. You can also have flows from different baths of chemicals or, or, or different things at different temperatures. Uh, you can have initial conditions where you're just kind of rolling downhill from being dropped at the top of a, a ski lift in a sense. So there's a lot of different ways the system can effectively be away from equilibrium uh, and, and be allowed to exhibit these dynamics. Uh, and a really uh, important insight uh, that really originated in, in various proto forms before the late 1990s, uh, uh, but I think was really uh, very effectively expounded and, and made operational uh, by, by Gavin Crooks uh, and Chris Rosinski and others um, in the late 1990s, and which has led to a real renaissance in non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, uh, is this result here, usually known as the Crookes relation, which says, and you can prove this for fairly general assumptions, that the thing we should now be thinking about is not the probabilities of states at the endpoint. We should think about the probabilities of dynamical trajectories, of movies. So if I'm driving a system, I have a sequence of states, which you could think of if you want as being like a bunch of chemical concentrations, perhaps, or it might be something uh, even more precisely arranged where this atom is here and that atom is there. Uh, but the point is that you have a movie going forward as you're driving the system, whatever way you're choosing to poke it over time. And then if you instead try to poke it with that pattern running backwards and waited to see if the system would now do the time reverse movie of the hamburger uneating itself or whatever you're talking about, the relative likelihood of these two movies has a rigorous relationship to the amount of heat that's getting evolved into the surroundings in the forward direction. So things that are movies that are more likely to be seen going forward than in the reverse are putting positive amounts of heat in the surroundings and losing it into the bath um, and not easily getting it back because it, it gets dissipated. Now this is a microscopic relation. Uh, and if we wanna talk about it in terms of macro things, it's a little more complicated because if you stop to think for a second, sometimes you do see things like ice freezing, but 
uh, ice when it, or sorry, things like ice liquefying. But ice, when it liquefies, it absorbs heat from its surroundings. So why would that be more likely than the reverse? Because uh, this relation I'm, I'm, I'm writing here makes it seem like the temperature shouldn't change that. And there we have to remember that ice is not one movie. It's really a sort of a family of movies of all the different ways that molecules microscopically can arrange themselves to look macroscopically like ice. Um, and so there's a, a, an internal entropy piece that makes the story a little more complicated when we talk about um, macroscopic things. So, so the relation here at the top is how this looks uh, in, in terms of its implications for macroscopic things. So using the Crookes relation, you can derive what you call kind of an expansion on the second law of thermodynamics. So usually we think of the second law of thermodynamics as being about total entropy has to always increase uh, in the universe, but just increasing is kind of a weak bound. Right, So being on the right side of zero, you could be very close to zero, you could be very far. In fact, what the Crookes relation implies is something more precise, which is that if you look even for macroscopic dynamics at the probability of transition rates between states in one direction and in the other, that the irreversibility or the sort of time asymmetry of those dynamics helps you to set a lower bound on really what's the total entropy change uh, for that process in one direction. Um, and, and this is true on average, because clearly with fluctuations, you can get rare events in which things buck the trend. So we're talking first in, in macroscopic terms and on average, but this quantity on the left-hand side at the top really is the total entropy change for the universe because the work minus the energy change is the dissipated energy, the heat that's lost into the surroundings. So that's the increase in the entropy of the surrounding bath. And then the second term is the internal entropy change. Like when ice liquefies, it increases its internal entropy, which is why you can pay for that and, and, and be okay uh, at the right temperature, even though you're actually uh, absorbing heat from the surroundings. So the individual micro trajectories of movies that run in that direction should all be less likely uh, because of uh, what we were just saying uh, in the previous slide. So I'll, this is just a little vignette I'll, I'll finish this slide with, but there's, um, there's one uh, uh, favorite first application of this result that I, I, like, I like to talk about which is you can think about self-replication, which pertains obviously to uh, this whole workshop. Uh, if you think about something that makes copies of itself and doesn't fall apart as fast as it makes those copies, actually this relation already implies thermodynamic constraints on how to make a copy of yourself, right? Because if I grow at a certain rate and I don't fall apart at that rate, which kind of is a sine qua non for being a self-replicator, because if I fall apart as fast as I grow, then I can't grow exponentially then I have a, a, a ratio greater than one in this forward over reverse rate. And if I take the log of that, and now I think there's some internal entropy change where I'm organizing my surroundings uh, every time I make a copy of myself, um, then I'm gonna have a positive number here that is the minimum amount of entropy production in the universe uh, that I have to have every time I make a copy of myself. So this is important for the constraints on copying yourself, because in order to increase the entropy of the universe, you need a, a fuel source generally. You know, where are you going to pay for that increase in the entropy of the universe? You need work being done on you or heat somehow being released into the surroundings that's coming from some stored fuel so that you can pay the piper and be able to cause that increase in entropy. Uh, and so this ends up setting constraints and you know, it's a longer discussion how useful those constraints are without further augmentation uh, when talking about even microscopic things like bacteria. Uh, but in, in principle, you are talking about, you don't get something for nothing. If you wanna make copies of yourself, you need to eat. Uh, and that's an interesting intuition, but it's, it's surprisingly possible to found it with relative rigor once you start thinking in terms of second law of thermodynamics. Another related thing that I'll just mention briefly that pertains to the organization of living things uh, and another kind of hallmark life-like behavior uh, which is a, a different result uh, that we worked on, I guess, maybe five years ago in my group when I was still at MIT, uh, is taking the Crookes relation and some other mathematical machinery, you can think about the energetic cost uh, of making a clock tick precisely. Uh, and so this was something that was first uh, kind of ansatz that was speculated by uh, Udo Zeifert, and then we proved a, a more general theorem that, that included this case, um, uh, but, but they had already essentially shown this must be true numerically. Uh, the, the basic idea is that if I want to make a process that has underlying thermal fluctuations in it so that it ticks at a constant rate and that the variability of the number of ticks in some amount of time is pushed to smaller and smaller values, 
right? So I want a, a clock that doesn't sometimes tick 15 times in 15 second, seconds and sometimes ticks 16 times in 15 seconds. I want it to always tick, you know, plus or minus 0. 0.0001, uh, one, uh, that 15, sec 15 times in 15 seconds. It turns out that the Crookes relation essentially alone already implies that you're going to have to spend a minimum amount of entropy production, which translates into fueling cost for the dissipation on each tick in order to be able to do that. So it's another thing that living things do. They, they not only tick, they also do other things where it's about somehow having steady motion in a certain either abstract or spatial direction um, and doing that in a way that isn't noisily forward and backward. Uh, but if you're gonna do that with precision, uh, then there's a minimum amount that you have to pay that goes in essentially to your fueling cost for each step that you take. Uh, so if, for those who are interested, uh, there's a paper associated with this idea. And, and one last thing I'll mention is there's also maintenance of the state of a living thing, right? That we said before, just in their architecture, living things are not at thermal equilibrium, right? They're, they're in often much higher energy states. They're often in much lower entropy, more orderly ensembles of arrangements of states. Um, and, and, and so if you turn off all the lights on a plant and put it in the box, you, you, it's, it's relaxing the thermal equilibrium from that point onward. And it might take a very long time, but it's dying because it's relaxing the thermal equilibrium. So that raises the question, if I wanna maintain myself in a non-equilibrium distribution over all the possible states the system could be in, what's the minimum amount of uh, fueling cost in terms of entropy production in the surroundings, right? Heat, I'm dissip dissipating into the surroundings that I have to pay per unit time in order to do that. So there's also a relation that you can work out um, by thinking in chemical physical terms about stochastic, you know, jumping transitions between different chemical states and the energetic cost of jumping over barriers and back. Um, so if you're going to supply an energy source to some system to maintain it in a distribution over states that's not its equilibrium state, what's the minimum you have to pay? And the intuition um, is actually fairly straightforward once you derive the result that there's a measure of how far you are from equilibrium that obviously is going to raise the cost. Uh, and then also uh, the, the amount you have to pay per unit time depends on the dynamics in the system. If you have very fast turnover between all the different states, you're going to have to pay a lot more per unit time because essentially the system would be falling apart much faster. So it's like you're giving it nudges back into the right state much more frequently. And so you have to pay that cost over and over again. So there's a, a dynamical quantity and a, a measure of distance from equilibrium. And those two things together are telling you how much do you have to eat per unit time just not to fall apart and not to stop being in the special subset of arrangements of your constituent parts that we would call Jeremy England still alive or something like that. <laughs> so, so those are all kind of vignettes where I, I point at the bottom to, to papers for those who are interested. Um, and and I, I wanna uh, talk about a kind of a, more uh, elaborate concept in self-organization that points towards particular ideas of, of life -like likeness in the remainder uh, of this discussion. But first, I just want to make a point that uh, one has to be very careful about uh, when talking about thermodynamics and life likeness, which is that entropy and what you would call organization in kind of uh, connoting the idea of function, for example, are not necessarily the same thing. It's usually true that in order to be organized, you kind of have to be low entropy by some standard, but not necessarily the reverse. Entropy is a very uh, neutral statistical property. You're really talking about if I uh, am counting the ways of arranging something, given that the collective set of arrangements, they all share some property, are there lots of ways of doing that or are there only a few? And just to you know, make the point here, um, if you pureed a cat and then took all the matter the cat was made of and squeezed it down into a volume the size of a bacterium, uh, you'd be lowering the entropy of the cat, even though it was this exquisitely organized thing. And now it's just, you know, a bunch of totally disorganized matter that then got put in a like, super powerful trash compactor. Entropy is just about number of possible arrangements. And when you can find things in space, they have fewer arrangements. So it's not necessarily the case that low entropy means organized. Um, but we, we do want the concept of entropy because it impacts probability. There are many scenarios in which what's likely is something that has higher entropy and also uh, things that are high entropy are hard to call organized usually because the concept of organization usually refers somehow to the idea that you're in a very special 
subset uh, of possible arrangements of your constituent parts. Um, so, so with all of that kind of prefatory remark, the idea I want to talk about for the rest of the talk um, is a concept uh, that in some of our, our previous work we've called dissipative adaptation. So I, I quoted the Boltzmann distribution to you before, which was this probability of different states being about relative likelihood be being determined by energy. And you can see there's still a factor here in the non-equilibrium case. But when you use the Crookes relation to derive this more general relation for relative likelihood of future events, you can see there are other terms. There's a kinetic term in the middle that I think for the sake of brevity, I won't talk, to, talk about a lot, but it essentially means you're more likely to go places that you're closer to or that you know, are uh, more accessible from your starting point in a finite amount of time. And then there's this last term that's about work history. And, and the way of summarizing it conceptually is to say, all things being equal, you're more likely to go into states where the only way of getting there was to absorb a really large amount of positive work from your surroundings on the way there over time. Uh, and so just as it's the case that ice is possible but not always guaranteed, meaning that you can lower the energy of water and it, you know, it freezes into a crystalline state some of the time. So sometimes low energy is what dominates the character of organization of the system as a whole. It also, we might hypothesize, and really we're starting to see evidence for, can be the case that sometimes the state of organization of the system gets driven to adopt really is dominated by this work history effect. That you should think about the whole history of the system and how it got to where it is and how it absorbed energy from the surroundings on the way there and whether the fingerprint of that history is still visible in the structure that ends up uh, being stabilized at the end. And the very simple conceptual idea is just that when you're jumping over barriers and you're using a pogo stick, meaning that you don't absorb energy from the surroundings and dissipate it as heat, you can easily go back the way you came. Right? But if instead you had a jetpack, where in some sense you got lifted up over some barrier uh, on one side, uh, but then once you're dropped down the other, you don't have any more lift. You've, you've lost the work that you absorbed and, and it's not being supplied to you where you still are, then you can get stuck. You can do something irreversible. You can't go back the way you came. And it's that irreversible maturation in the state of systems with many components that we want to think about now. So we're used to thinking about adaptation in a phenotypic space biologically, right? That a blue whale is adapted to living in the sea and not living on top of a mountain. So the question is, is there some kind of notion of selection or adaptation that we can start to look for in the physical chemical sense of self-assembly of pieces that they stick together in different ways, depending on the forces that are pushing on them? And, and what this is going to be about is the same way that biological evolution is this very time-directed, irreversible progression towards states that have a certain relationship to the environment. The accumulation of irreversible configurational changes, changes in shape, in a system as it's being pushed on uh, is going to be what bears out in our in terms of our ability to predict things about or, or explain things about the structures uh, that emerge because you can think now about every change in shape of your system as though it's kind of like this picture right that there's a person with a jetpack and where they are currently is the shape the system is in and where they might be soon uh, is the shape the system could get knocked into by the forces pushing on it so what happens if you keep, I'm going to fast forward ahead because I want to use a picture that's coming up here. Sorry. Yeah. What happens if you keep on jumping around, you keep exploring, you keep on changing your shape, but sometimes the barrier you cross is irreversible because you were in one place and you got a lot of lift and then you landed somewhere else and you don't get as much lift. So now you can't go back the way you came and there's some kind of maturation in the state of the system that has to do with the access to energy that you have from the environment in a way that depends on your shape. So what do I mean by access to energy depending on your shape? Well, in biology, we think of this in terms of functional organization of living things, right? If I have an enzyme and I can eat a sugar in my environment, then I can access the energy in the form that it's in in my environment and all the biochemical wheels go round and round and I can stay in my state. That already implies in terms of the idea of organization that we're in a very non-random arrangement of our constituent parts. So if you just mutate enzymes slightly, or let alone do something like totally rearrange all the atoms of a living thing, you're not going to get something necessarily that's as good and as well suited to interacting with the energy sources in that particular environment. So living things tend to be well matched to energy sources in their environment compared with random rearrangements of their constituent parts. And that's what it kind of means to have form and function. 
So if we think in terms of the configurational histories of building blocks as they're assembling, the question is, are there similar implications for the evolution of a self-assembly process where there's some environment pushing on it, there's different building blocks sticking together and breaking apart, and we don't have parents and grandparents, so we don't have the Darwinian principle that allows us to say we look like what came before and was able to copy itself, but we do have antecedent structures. We have shapes we used to be in, and when we were in those shapes, they may have had variable ability to absorb energy from the surroundings. So for example, we know that if you play the right pitch that's loud enough at some glass, it can vibrate a lot and it can shatter. And we usually think about changing the pitch and then we can't shatter the glass anymore because it doesn't resonate. But you could also think about changing the, the shape of the glass, right? The same working material could be in a different state. And in that different state, it would not get as much lift from the environment. It wouldn't be able to rearrange itself as much and undergo perhaps a very irreversible shattering event because although it's the same matter, it's in a state that's not kind of an antenna for the energy source in the environment. And so what that just means to illustrate to you is there actually a very simple many body physical mechanical examples that you can already think of where the way matter is arranged, the current combination of building blocks has a particular ability or inability to absorb energy from sources in its environment. And the feedback loop that closes here, and this is gonna be the argument for the rest of what we're talking about, is that energy getting into the system is both controlled by the shape that you're in, and also it influences how you change your shape. So when that feedback loop closes, what you get is a biased exploration of the space of possible shapes. And it's biased by the particular patterns of how energy sources on the, in the environment are able or unable to deliver energy into the system, whatever shape it's in. So uh, I wanna leave time for uh, questions and discussion. So I'm, I'm gonna uh, just show you one example of a system that we've studied that has this property. We are trying to look for kind of generic, simple toy mechanical examples where they have the ingredients to look kind of like what chemistry has to be doing in a conceptual sense, but they're simpler than chemistry. So obviously chemistry is really complicated and there's all this kind of combinatorics from having lots of copies of the same thing. Um, and we're not handling that. This is just a mechanical network. It has a set of nodes, which are masses. They're in a two dimensional plane and they just have these bonds that are unbreakable that connect them, but the bonds are bistable. So they can pop open and be long or they can close and be short. They live in this bistable potential. And then you just have a bunch of random bonds that you've quenched. You're not changing the bonds. So it's, it's just a random network. So there's a certain sense of quasi randomness to how different states are connected to each other and, and how what, what arrangements of the system have different properties. And then you wanna just make an energy source available that has a particular pattern and see what happens over time. Because what you want is, is what the system has. It has many metastable states that have differing ability to absorb energy from the environment, depending on what state you're in, because depending on what bonds are long or short, you have different normal modes, you resonate differently. So you have this kind of library of different relationships to the environment that the dynamics can search. And then you just supply an energy source that's strong enough to jump this thing up and make it kind of start changing from one state to another. And there's dissipative drag. And so it's kind of losing energy as heat all the time. So it has the ability to settle down. And then we see what happens. So at short times, what you get is very chaotic behavior because the system is highly nonlinear, right? The dynamics are, are violently, chaotically nonlinear because you're supplying enough energy to jump over these saddles in, that pop the bonds open and closed. So it's definitely not a linear system. And all that nonlinearity combines with all the energy you're pumping into the system and it kind of thermalizes. And it just looks like the system is doing a random walk in configuration space. I'm speaking loosely. I don't mean that we've characterized that exactly. I think actually a lot of apparent randomness is just too high dimensional for us to see the non-randomness, but also quite low dimensional perhaps compared with true randomness. Um, but in any case, after enough time, you get a change. The system settles down. The system finds a particular arrangement that happens to be very good at staying the way it is given the way you're driving the system. So you've chosen a particular direction and frequency and amplitude of forcing, and the system just kind of jumps around and rearranges, and then it settles. And then once it does, the work absorption goes down, the, the bonds stop changing which ones are open and closed, and you've sort of found your selected adapted state that's matched to the way you started driving the system. 
So the interesting thing about this is that you can just keep readapting. So if I keep changing the drive, then the system adapts differently depending on how I drive it. For example, I could drive with an oscillation in time of a certain frequency, uh, or I could drive, uh, sorry, of a certain frequency where the force is the thing that's oscillating, or I could drive uh, where one of the particles positions is the thing that's oscillating. And those are actually two very different things because in one case, if I'm gonna settle down into a, a particular state and be well matched to my environment uh, so that my, the energy source in my environment is not blasting me to smithereens, but it's kind of keeping me in step in this low dimensional arrangement, then if it's oscillating force, what I wanna do is resonate less. And you see this in, in the right panel that the resonance uh, with the drive frequency goes down uh, once you drive with a certain frequency for a while. But then you switch with the same frequency to oscillating the, the, not the force, but the position of a particle in this network. And that's different because position oscillation, you're gonna absorb less energy. Instead, if the stiffness of all the modes that are coupled to that motion is low, because then you can't do a lot of work because there isn't a lot of resistive force from the network. And so then you get this adaptation where it rearranges and actually instead what you get um, is these sort of slack modes that have very low stiffness are the ones that couple to the driven particle. And you can just switch back and forth and readapt. But I think the thing to emphasize here is that every time you do this, the state you end up in is different. It's not that you went back to the same exact state. The library of possibilities here, you know, is two to the end essentially for all the bonds being long and short. So you never are microscopically in the same adapted state. It's that the phenotype, right? The selection principle applies to the behavior and you can always evolve a new behavior that has that matching once the terms of the environment are set and the system can explore and adapt. So it sort of parallels the way that we explore genetic space, right? That multiple attempts at adapting in the same environment are never gonna be genetically identical, but they might be phenotypically identical because that's how you adapt. There's a great paper by Michael Desai doing that with yeast, for example. Uh, last thing I'll, I'll show you with this system, uh, which is kind of fun, uh, is, is just to see a movie of what one of these things look like. But I, I uh, cherry picked one because some of the movies, you know, they, they, they look generically kind of similar, but this one has a special extra feature that's not so hard to find, uh, but, it, but it's kind of interesting. So again, here's this early transient where you wobble uh, the force on one of these particles, all the other ones are coupled to, to it. They do something that looks kind of chaotic and random. And then if you fast forward, the system gets into a state where it gets much more quiescent and it's still being driven. It's still non-equilibrium. It's in a non-equilibrium state where energy is coursing through it and jumping things up above where they would be if you let the system settle in thermal equilibrium. However, it's obviously moving much less violently. But if you look at the work absorption at the bottom here, plotted over a long time, what you see is it actually spikes. So where are those spikes coming from? Well, if you just run this faster, what you see is that this thing actually has become a motor by accident, right? There are a few kind of loose degrees of freedom here and they're doing a detailed balance, break, a detailed balance breaking cycle where the energy that's being absorbed into the system through this driven particle has kind of spontaneously organized um, into a duty cycle that pumps this thing around in a circle over and over again. So this is like a little pulley that you could use to pull a bucket up a hillside or something. Um, and, and so that's not to say this means anything whatsoever for the, the, the emergence of, of actual life, but maybe it's an example of how once very generic forces are forcing a lot of correlated motion that just you get for free from self-organization that's, that's more about matching between the environment and the surroundings, it may not actually be so difficult uh, to by accident create kind of the rough cut of a motor um, just because that's what you're left with once you've settled down most of the degrees of freedom and something that's still being driven. Uh, this was the slide that I should have put up before when I was talking about this, this genetic versus phenotypic uh, similarity. This is just showing that uh, these systems don't recapitulate the same structure under identical conditions if you just have a little bit of thermal noise. You'll always find a new state and phenotypically the work absorption will be low once you've adapted uh, but you will not uh, be in the same uh, exact microstate. You'll be in some different uh, microscopic arrangement that has that same phenotypic local matched response property that's evolved and adapted to the environment. Um, so with that, 
I, I want to thank a, a great number of people uh, and, and places and, and sources of support that over the years have contributed to a lot of this different work. Uh, there's certainly other things uh, that have, have come out of uh, this uh, stream or, or line of thinking uh, that I, I encourage people to go check out. For example, we had a paper on Swarm Robotics that came out uh, in science at the beginning of 2021 that really is the first genuinely experimental, meaning actually things on a tabletop as opposed to simulations of kind of experiments in a simulated world. It's the first experimental test of, of the predictive power of these ideas. Um, and I think it, it really carries the, the chain forward from this last set of results that I was just showing you. Um, uh, so I, I encourage people to check that out, um, whether on uh, the lab website or, or just going out and, and, and Googling. Um, and um, as, as Paul mentioned before, I wrote a book where I tried to do kind of a, a, a trade press exposition of some of these ideas. And I think I tried as hard as possible to still make it uh, almost like I was just writing uh, a, a conceptual essay for scientific colleagues, not, not entirely, but I think that scientists will find there's still plenty to get out of it, even though in principle, it's also written so that a broader audience can um, access and appreciate it. Uh, so I encourage people to check out, uh, that out as well. Um, and I think that is it for what I prepared. So I, I'd love to respond to any questions or comments. Thank you very, very much, Jeremy. That was wonderful. Um, so I'm, we're open for questions. If you have a question, um, just uh, let's go on. This is going to be a, an interesting conversation. So I have a... Um, here we go, Vic. Um, <clears throat> so Vic is asking, are there concrete examples in biology of shape adaptation to dissipate a driving force? Example is protein folds. Um, so there definitely are examples in biology where all of these ingredients are there. And actually, I have a slide right here that, that talks about um, one of them. Uh, and, and another slide right here that talks about another. But if you think about how molecular motors work and how they harvest dissipative flows and turn them into organized motion, what, what it is all about is the fact that proteins change their configuration depending on what is touching them. So what other things are binding to them. Um, they're, they're being pushed around in their energy landscape by the other influences of those kinds. Um, and, and then as a result, if you have things like different chemical baths at different chemical potentials, you could use that to turn that into a mechanical power stroke by just letting flow from one of these baths couple to configurational changes. And then the key thing is those configurational changes in turn will change your ability to bind to things. So you kind of open and close um, and, and you could harvest a, a power stroke from that. Now, I think that one really exciting thing about this, um, and, and this is something I, I really would have cherished the chance to, to talk with Danny more about um, and had actually begun to uh, uh, correspond with him a, a few months ago um, uh, along these lines, um, is that if you think about molecular chaperones, which is something um, I worked on during my PhD and, and obviously Danny did landmark work on, molecular chaperones are proteins that help other proteins to fold. Uh, and they do that by having selective binding preferences where they bind proteins only in particular conformations. And then they also undergo conformational changes themselves that are powered by chemical fuel. And then as a result of those conformational changes, they change the conformation of the protein they're bound to. So we think of chaperones kind of uh, wearing our hats as biologists as though they're like an ambulance that rushes to the scene of a, a protein misfolding event and tries to fix things. But you can also just think of all proteins as kind of kinetically trapped many body systems that have lots of different arrangements that are available to them. And then molecular chaperones are a way of coupling that search of configuration space to a source of chemical energy whose availability do does depend on the configuration of the system. So whether you're talking about molecular motors, molecular chaperones, mobility induced by enzymatic activity in cells, I think that the cell as a whole, you have to think of as this incredible opportunity for the kind of adaptive response in collective behavior that I was trying to refer to in this mechanical network model, for example. And so if that's true, then it's very tempting to wonder, you know, what can cells do that they don't need to have Darwinianly learned to do? What can they sort of learn to do on the fly? 
uh, because they actually have a lot of adaptive computing power kind of built into uh, the thing that they are assembled out of. And then maybe going back to the origins of life, you start to wonder, maybe there are things that we could add to uh, you know, what, what we're willing to consider in terms of what the beginning point of life like this looks like. You know, we sometimes think about uh, cellularization or think about um, self-replication of a message uh, as being very important components. And indeed they certainly are, but if you can get certain kinds of highly fine-tuned relationship to energy sources in the environment in kind of an ecosystem or herd behavior of molecules without those things, um, then maybe that gives you part of your starting point, even if it doesn't complete the picture. Okay, thank you. So vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the free energy gap, we think about, at least I think about it in terms of uh, uh, the change in electrical field potential as the major driver in life. So. Um, when you think about, you know, you have, the way I put it often is that you have one power supply, which is the sun. You have two wires, which is the ocean and the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And then you have all these diodes on a circuit board, basically, which is life, right? And so if you think about this, the, the, the smallest free energy gap uh, that is useful in life is probably hydrogen oxidation reduction. Mm -hmm. And then you get to larger and larger and larger energy gaps, ultimately to the, uh, the explosion, uh, basically, of water to make oxygen. So I think about that as an evolutionary sequence. Mm -hmm. OK, and do you, you think that that is a useful way to think about this from a physical point of view? So without knowing the mechanics, just the physics. So this is an entropy and uh, enthalpy uh, system, if you think well, about it. I think that the way that I would put it is that, well, so maybe maybe it, it helps to call attention to a property of what I was just describing that I, I didn't emphasize, but which is very important to this discussion, which is this question of why living things aren't blown to smithereens by the energy that they use, which we don't, I mean, to some degree, when people would talk about, you know, uh, reactive oxidized species, then we are suddenly worried about that uh, you know, as byproducts of metabolism. We kind of take for granted that, oh, well, we eat food and it's good for us or plants absorb light and it's good for them. Uh, but of course, I can't just eat uh, an equivalent amount in joules of dynamite or gamma radiation and be fine. And the reason that's true is because introducing a source of energy into a living system that the system is largely naive to, or you know, isn't usually powered by, is usually a bull in a china shop. And that's true all the more so for these bigger gaps, like what you're referring to, right? That if you right. are, are trying to drop something down from a very great height, and you do that all at once, you're just setting off a molecular bomb inside a cell. Um, and, and so the electron transport chain is this beautifully exquisite way of dropping things down safely so that you don't, you can harvest huge amounts of energy without blowing things to pieces uh, and, and, and breaking all these chemical uh, bonds in the process. You break the ones that you want to. So the question is, how does that emerge? Uh, and, and I think that in the example that we already saw, we, we actually are looking at something that has that property. That would be actually the, the lifelike property I really like to emphasize most when talking about that example. It's that when you change the energy source, right? That spike in work absorption is, is an increase in chaos also. The system is basically ripped shreds and then it reemerges as newly adapted to a different energy source where it can be hit hard because it's in a shape that's good at receiving that powerful source of energy in ways that kind of drive it around in circles and carry it back to where it started instead of dispersing it into an incredibly high dimensional space of random exploration of new configurations. So, I think that what you're pointing to um, is, is exactly that if you try to start with like a very big gap, maybe you're, you're not easily going to discover ab initio, the mechanism you need to build out of your constituent parts that will enable you to handle that and not just continually be randomized by it. Um, but I, I think thinking through you know, how that process has to happen in kind of a hierarchical or sequential way it, it, it's a very interesting um, uh, reaction to react to, you know, the, the, to, to hear you to, to comment in this way, because I hadn't thought of it in terms of 
widening the gap over time. But it'll be interesting to think about whether it's easier to handle less randomizing kind of smaller jumps to begin with. But then once you adapt in that way, you might be in a better position to kind of incrementally you know, bridge to the next point. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? And I appreciate uh, being invited to do this very much. I'm, I'm glad we, we made it work. <laughs>